Dear friends, according to where you are, good morning, good afternoon, or good night. This is Ali Mutlu Köylüoğlu. I would like to welcome you all on behalf of Citizens Basic Income Turkey. Today, our valuable guest is our dear friend, Professor Dr. Guy Standing. He is one of the founders and the honorary co-chair of BN, Basic Income Earth Network, and uh, also a professor of development studies at the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. We would like to express our gratitude to him for his contributions as our guest speaker of today. By the way, uh, this meeting is a part of the VTG Sohbetleri, which means CBI, Citizens Basic Income Talks. Uh, using this opportunity, I would like to remind you our worldwide 21st meeting of UBI advocates and UBI networks on tomorrow at GMT 14 Turkey. Uh, you know, we are holding these worldwide meetings on second and fourth Tuesdays of each month. Uh, the draft agenda of tomorrow's meeting is on the screen. The first agenda item will be a brainstorming session while advocating UBI, a discussion on exploration of potential visions beyond our comfort zones. At the beginning, there will be a triggering presentation uh, and the title of it is Basic Income, Existing Typical Politicians, and Lady Macbeth symbolism. The second agenda will be a survey design regarding the future year 2021 of worldwide meetings of UBI advocates and UBI networks. Of course, uh, as usual, we will continue with the news from working groups and news from UBI advocates and UBI networks. Hope to see you and hear your contributions during these meetings too. Back to today's meeting, we would like to thank dear guy a lot once again and leave the microphone to him. Uh, dear guy, word is yours. Please unmute yourself. Of course. Yeah. First of all, first of all, I wish I were in Turkey with you. And uh, I know that Turkey and my Turkish friends are suffering from COVID at the moment and its rise rate of, of COVID. I do hope that everybody listening are safe and that their loved ones are safe because I think this is a time when we're learning some painful but useful lessons as human beings across the world. The pandemic is teaching us that the resilience of all of us together depends on the resilience of every individual because we're all vulnerable. And this is teaching us, I think, a sense of humility, a sense of empathy with others. Could we be the other at any moment? And I think it's in a strange way, strengthening our sense of social solidarity as human beings. And of course, that is, a vital lesson for all of us who support and advocate basic income. Because the essence of basic income is that what we're talking about is a matter of common justice. Justice in the sense that public wealth of Turkey, of England, wherever, is far more to do with the efforts and achievements of many generations of our ancestors before us and anything we do ourselves and if we allow for private inheritance of private wealth which every government does should we not think of the idea of a base income as a public dividend a social dividend that a slight share of that wealth for every man and woman and child in our society. For me, that's the fundamental ethical reason why I've always advocated basic income. But it's also a matter of being emancipatory. It gives us the freedom and the freedom of everybody to say no to people who are exploitative or oppressive or abusive or use their position of authority to insult us. If you have basic income security, you can say no. 
It's a vital freedom. It's also a freedom to be moral, a freedom to make decisions that we think are justifiable because of what we believe. But you can't do that if you're critically insecure or in poverty or, or so stressed that, you know, you can't be rational. So a basic income is emancipatory. And the basic income is also by definition something that gives people basic security. Security is a human need. We all want basic security for ourselves, for our loved ones, our children, our community, our friends. And shouldn't we want security for everybody as human beings? Basic income is a fundamental mechanism for moving in that direction. It's not a panacea. It's not a panacea. It doesn't solve all of society's problems. But what it is, is an indicator, a commitment to move along the road to that sense of justice, that sense of freedom, and that sense of security. For me, that is why I've always advocated basic income and why I've written the books and why people like you, Ali, and myself and our friends are on a journey through bien, through our movements, through our activities. And I'm actually encouraged at the moment that millions of people around the world, through this pandemic, are realizing and are coming out in support and that is what we're talking about today. Mobilizing people to demand a basic income. I believe we're on a good road. Uh, thank you, uh, dear guy. Uh, maybe we can hear some questions. In fact, I have many, but if there are any questions from our friends. Dear friends, uh, is there any uh, uh, friend who would like to ask questions? As far as I see, there isn't any. Guy, may I ask a question? Sure. <laughs> in fact, uh, it's a good opportunity to discuss these issues with you. Uh, in Turkey, we started uh, basic income discussions. I mean, there were some academic studies before, but uh, as an activism uh, group, we started uh, late 2015 and early 2016. And our main mot main motivation was in order to in order to have healthy democracy practice, uh, everybody in the society should have economical independence. Uh, and the UBI can give this chance to everybody. So would you please say fibers or your uh, ideas regarding healthy democracy practice and UBI? This is uh, something we would like to hear from you too. I have a lot of friends here, I, I see them. Uh, so my question is healthy democracy practice and uh, uh, UBI relation. Well, Ali, as you probably know, and we all know the enmity between Turkey and Greece over the centuries, the millennia. But as it happens, uh, you can actually attribute uh, support for a basic income as an instrument of democracy back to Pericles, 450 BC. And he reasoned, and his friends with him reasoned, that they wanted every citizen participate in the life of the polis, in the life of democracy, in the practice of participating in political life as part of shole, part of, of education and part of political participation. And he reasoned that if people were going to have to devote time and energy to being democratic, then they should be compensated for their time. So he instituted a form of basic income. I think that was a very enlightened thing to do. 
I believe that a basic income today would do the same. It would enable people to spend more time being democratic, being educated, participating in social life as active citizens. And we should want that. I think one of the worst phenomena in the last 50 years has been the commodification of politics, the commodification of social life, so that we're all consumers and we all feel or act as if we had no time to be citizens. Of course, that's not the case with everybody, but there's a tendency for that. And I, I really believe that a basic income would tilt the use of time to more socially participatory activities, including volunteering, including care work that's unpaid, and including political work. And I think that it is an instrument for democracy. Uh, thank you very much, dear guy. There are uh, two questions coming. One is from uh, our professor, Professor uh, Ezer Artuna. Maybe you will remember, remember him from the Worldwide Cong uh, Congress in Finland. Uh, and after uh, him, we will hear Hannes Mera. Uh, professor Artuna, uh, I'm trying to see you. Uh, Ezer Artuna. Okay, Professor Atuna, please unmute yourself. Oh, yes, I can see you very well. Very good. Nice to see you. And, and nice to see you again. Uh, well, uh, we, we're all fine, and I, I'm glad that you're fine also. Good, thank uh, you. Well, uh, I'm an economist, managerial economist. But mm -hmm. Now, I believe that we are reaching a crossroad. Either Bill, uh, the, this century will be the best century we had or the worst one, depending on the strategies we follow. One of the strategy we have to, I mean, we are obliged to, obliged to uh, implement is the, the basic income. It is because the job, we are entering a new world jobs will be different, the works will be different, jobs and works are very different also. And uh, the people have been selling their time, but now they, say they will sell their ideas. The time is limited, but ideas develop, they develop if you give them a chance. And universal basic income will give chance to people, to everyone, to develop themselves, to make themselves more important for the society and for themselves. So I think, uh, well, of course, it will, we'll have to have other strategies also, education strategies about education, everything will change. It will be a new world and this pandemic has shown us that the world is change, can change how fast. So, so I believe that we have to uh, we have to forget all our ideas, and we have to prepare ourselves for the, to the new uh, new world, new society, new new work areas, and. Uh, the universal in income it will be one of the strategies we'll have to follow. We must, otherwise, I we will have very difficult time adapting to the new world. Uh, and, uh, by the, sorry, by, ed, I said adapting, but we, I should I should also say that uh, we uh, it's it's our it's in our hands to make the world a happy, joyful, and a humanitarian, and 
the technology has given us the, the chance, but at the same time, at the same time, if we don't use it properly, it will uh, be a disaster. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Artuna. Uh, dear guy, would you like to say? Yeah. Uh, please. Yeah, I, I, I have a, a lot of sympathy with what you just said. And for my part, I, I've written a book recently, which was published just before the pandemic arrived, which is called Battling Eight Giants. And what I've argued in that book is that basically the road to a good society, the sort of society that you've been talking about, is currently blocked by these eight giants that I've identified. And briefly, they are inequality, which is terrible, insecurity, which is widespread, stress, which is a pandemic in itself before the COVID arrived, debt, precarity, the threat of the robots. I believe in AI and automation, but as it is, they are disruptive and preventing many, many people from gaining access to incomes and security. And the worst threat, of course, that is blocking the road is the threat of extinction. The crisis in the ecology, the threat to the species. And of course, we're learning that the the threat includes the threat to ourselves as human beings. This is already the sixth major pandemic this century. It's an extraordinary phenomenon. And that means that all of us could suddenly be threatened by death, threatened by morbidity, and a good society can't come unless we deal with that threat of extinction. And the eighth, the eighth giant, and this relates to another question that I've seen come up in the, in the chat box, is the threat of neo-fascist populism. I hope all of us in this dialogue this afternoon are mightily relieved that Donald Trump has been pushed off the stage. But the threat's still there. He got 74 million votes despite being a terrible person. And we have to realize that that threat of populism, which we know in every European country, including Turkey, is very strong, can only be defeated if we collectively are offering a better set of policies so that people who tend to vote for populists turn away from a horrible authoritarian surveillance-based panopticon society, which we should all be fearing. Thank you, Guy. Uh... I have uh, in my list, uh, dear Hannes Meher from Germany, then Diana Bashur from Austria and Valeria Kolesic, and then Gerda Palmadotir. And uh, dear Hannes, would you please unmute yourself? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. That sounds great. Um, Guy, thanks so much for your, for your introduction. And um, I was just wondering if you could tell us what you think about a um, let's say the relation between the basic income movement on the one hand and other very strong political movements on the other hand. For example, the uh, climate movement right now, um, especially in France, we can see um, a very strong association between these two because um, the, the uh, Yellow West movement was uh, basically initiated by an introduction of a carbon tax. And so do you think that like movements joining forces, it is, is actually advisable? Or do you think that the, like a joint movement between be it basic income and the climate movement would be, would be weaker than the sum of the individual uh, movements? Thank you. Well, let, let me say that I think that's an excellent question. And I've thought about it a lot. And I've, I've actually, in my, in my books, I, I've advocated that strength will depend on the various movements coming together. I believe the Gilets Jaunes, the Precariat movements, the Greens, the Extinction Rebellion, which I support 100%, 
if they come together collectively, we will be much stronger. I think all those groups actually support the idea of a basic income. Just as I think the main groups in the basic income movement uh, are supporting the Gilets Jaunes, are supporting the Extinction Rebellion, are supporting Greens. There's a natural sympathy between us. And we will only defeat the conservatives, the far right, the neoliberals, and the old social democrats as well. I don't exclude them from my critique. We will only defeat them if we are united and we put pressure on the politicians, on our political institutions, and mobilize in different ways. I was delighted recently that the Greens in Germany have come out in favor of basic income. My friends, the Greens in Britain have come out in favor of basic income. And, and it's, it's something that that's, goes together. One of the threats of extinction is such that we need to have major tax reform. Major tax reform means that we need high carbon taxes. We need them. If you don't have car high carbon taxes, we will not effectively shift the system away from carbon fuels and all the rest of greenhouse gas emissions. All the other things, they're just postponing real action. We need fundamentally a high level of eco taxes. The problem with eco taxes is that they are regressive. They tend to increase inequality because a poorer person is paying a higher percentage of their income for that tax than a richer person even though it's the rich who are causing most of the pollution and the greenhouse gas emissions, etc. And the thing, the site, the reasoning should be that, yes, we want those carbon taxes, but we're going to recycle, redistribute the revenue gained from those taxes in the form of basic incomes, mm -hmm. green, green dividends, whatever you want to call it but they should be part of the basic income. Now, when you do that, then it suddenly becomes a popular policy. I happen to be living in Switzerland where actually that's, that's done in a small way and it's very popular. In British Columbia, they're also been introducing that combination and other parts of Canada are thinking of it, the federal level too. And I think that that is a really a good way of thinking of how to reduce inequality, how to tackle greenhouse gas emissions, and how to give people this basic security that we all desperately need in the pandemic time. Great, thank you. Uh, dear guy, uh, we have a small problem. Uh, Diana Bashur, she's at the moment uh, in class, let's say, and she's following our event uh, and she has the Under question the that I will ask on behalf of her. Her question is, could basic income then be dangerous for the political ruling elite in a non-democratic state? Could basic income then be dangerous for the political ruling elite in a non-democratic state? I think anything that is a threat to the non-democratic elite anywhere is something that is good. I believe that we must foster and strengthen democracy, respect for human rights, respect for nature rights. And I think that the tyrants of the world, the elites of the world, the plutocrats have got to be lured back into society. I don't want anybody persecuted or anybody harmed or anything stupid like that. I believe that it's partly a question of education, partly a question of dismantling rentier capitalism, which is giving the plutocrats more and more of the income and allowing them to foster politicians who will support them and allow them to increase their wealth and power. I think this is fundamentally unhealthy to the strongest possible degree. The first question that came to me from Ezra, I think is absolutely spot on. We need a strategy for defeating the tyrannical elite, the plutocrats. 
And I think basic income is merely an expression, merely part of that strategy to disempower the plutocrats, disempower elites. But in a sense, I would speak to them and say, look, it's for your own interest and the interest of your children and your friends that we do change directions. I've been invited to speak in Davos uh, three years in a row, invited to speak in Silicon Valley uh, several times. And I find actually quite a few of those plutocrats, those billionaires, when you explain it, they understand. And they realize that if they don't allow for this to happen, the situation is going to lead to social violence. More social violence will come down the road. More violence that will ruin society, more violence that will threaten them and drive them into compounds where they have guards to support them, they have gated communities, and a life that is actually not particularly attractive. And I think that they're learning that. And many of the wiser ones, and not every rich person is an idiot and a fascist by any means, they are learning that they need to make concessions for the sake of a good society, for their children, for our children, for humanity itself. And I think this is where we stand today. We've got a new US president. We've got a new opening, if you like. We're breathing a collective sigh of relief, but it will only lead somewhere positive if we can enrich our public debate. And I believe basic income is part of the solution that will lead to a good society. And it is more important today than at any time during my lifetime or yours. Uh, thank you very much, Guy. Uh, Valeria, dear Valeria, would you like to ask your question or your contribution? Um, well, I would just like to mention that Guy Standing uh, and Philip van Paris uh, and uh, one professor from Germany are going to be in Zagreb next week talking about UBI. And I'm going to be there as well as uh, uh, in person, uh, as an expert uh, for UBI from the member state, um, neighboring state. Uh, and I hope uh, we will start talking uh, about how um, to make progress in implementation of UBI, maybe in Croatia. That's the reason I'm going to be there. Uh, uh, and I have a comment, maybe out of the topic, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, well, you see, I would like to connect uh, the, the fact that Slovenia is the first country right now, I don't know if uh, in the world or only in Europe, in that, uh, that that's connected with COVID. Interesting is that we have such mortality because people are going to work be even if they are sick. The point is because we have such an old bureaucratic system, they cannot put forward thousand and thousand quarantines and uh, national health uh, insurances. So people don't know if they will have something to live on if they don't work. The point is that we in Slovenia now can see how, uh, what that sentence is the country that doesn't have UBI. Well, thank you. Thank you, Valerie, uh, for those comments. I 
agree with your sentiments. I, we have an English word for what you've just described, because it's an, a phenomenon that's not just in Slovenia. It's a phenomenon that's affecting uh, most countries in the world. And the word is presenteeism. It's the opposite of absenteeism. Absenteeism is when a person doesn't turn up to the job because of illness or fear or something. Presenteeism is when they turn up for a job when, in all good sense, they shouldn't turn up because they're either ill, they're suffering from something, or they're desperately worried about a child or an elderly parent they feel they need to look after, whatever the reason. They feel they just have to go to the job because they fear losing it, they fear losing the money, they fear being described variously negatively. And it's a stupid phenomenon, it's a ridiculous phenomenon. It's, it's a nasty phenomenon. But it's a reality that millions of people experience. And my books in the precariat have led me to receive emails from so many people. And one of the things they often tell me is that, yeah, they turn up for a job, they're not feeling well, going, to that job makes them more ill, makes them have bigger medical bills, and many of them collapse from the accumulation of these things. And of course, you're right. If we had a basic income, people could judge when it's good for them to do and not to do. And that's one of the virtues of this freedom, the ability to say no. It's so important. And unless you've been there, unless you've seen it, unless you've experienced it, you don't fully appreciate how that affects so many people. And I, I, I cannot agree with you more that this is one of the reasons why we want a basic income. And no other system of social security adequately protects people from the problems you've just outlined. So I agree with what you've said. Thank you, Guy. Uh, dear Valeria, uh, there's a request. Would you please share the details of this event, which you will be also joining uh, in the chat box. Uh, next, uh, dear Gerdor, Gerdor Palmadotir. Dear Gerdor, I cannot see you at the moment. So, I'm here. Yeah, please. Good. No problem. Good to see you all. I'm really excited to see uh, and, and to hear everything that is happening. What I feel, I feel still that we have too much link between, between your lifeline, everybody's lifeline and earned income, a job. A job should be addition to your lifestyle, to your, uh, yeah, to your life actually, but basic income should be an absolute human right. It should be the first thing an obligationary of every single state is to be able to uh, provide uh, the livelihood and access to, uh, to uh, social life. It is just your, you know, just a part of your livelihood. And a state that cannot do it or will not do it will be, will be uh, degraded. It's a de degradation not to be able to do that. And we have to make it like that, not to ask for a meager, uh, meager uh, dividend of uh, of their income. No, it is our right. Everybody's right. And if you think about it, everybody's ec the economy. The economy that we are talking about, we talk about the differentiation between, for example, UBI and all these uh, social, social associations that we should stick together. But the thing is that we have it all separated because all our system is separated. How can you be an economist if you don't know anything about ec ecology? Ecology and uh, economy they are, are two sides of the same coin. There is no sustainability if it is not based on ecology. And that is why that if we promote that, we will be much more of a union because the whole life chain is a union. And the thing is that 
uh, we are always talking about hiring taxes, hiring this and hiring that in order to be able to finance UPI. UPI is self self sustainable because UPI uh, provides the seeds to grow prosperity. It it uh, it provides people the ability to earn their own life by growing things, by doing things. But everything with this talk about uh, prosperity is always linked to venture capitalism, to capitalism, to financing, to this and to that. And if these financiers don't see a lot of money in the morning after, there is no uh, uh, capital left. And everything that is supposed to to uh, be a job is based on, on a growth for a third party. Always that you're working for somebody. We should not have to work for anybody. That has to be a separate income. The income of earned income is a deal between you and the person you want to uh, put your energy uh, to or with. And you should be like a teamwork of a company, not to always to talk about company and employees as two enemies. No, they are working on the same goal and you want to give your time to that company. And so we have to have a different attitude to it all. And then, you know, and I, I was, I think that is a very, very important thing to separate the two, you know, very, very clearly. And we are talking about the new president of America. And I don't know if we put our, what do you call it, the, the, the mask also for our eyes, because there is no new president in the States. It is the oligarch that was there before Trump was. The, 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 clan, uh, the clan around Biden is the, is the same platform that, that, that produced Trump. And they both are horrible. I'm so sorry about that. That's why we really have to support the democracy, which does not exist in America. We all know that. So we don't have to talk about a new president and new democracy and all that. We have to really a huge, huge problem there because less evil or evil, the outcome is evil. So we have to all as a united people all around the world to talk about that and, and really focus there. I know I'm such a bore because I'm really negative about this, but we have to realize what is happening in AP to be able to change it. Like Biden, for example, he will support the TPP, TTIP and, and TISA. And that is the absolute, uh, the, uh, absolute giveaway from all what we call democracy. It is the last goodbye. So we really have to find out how to, how to so, and the only way how to protect us, to, 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 pre, to protect humanity is your basic income. I, I, I see it as the base for anything that we can stand up. And because also that every single company, every single entity, every single thing that is happening in society is based on our investment in society. No company has been established without reading or writing. That's our basic income, and a basic education, and we all financed it. So I think that we have to take it from there. Basic education, basic income, basic humanity. So let's do it, guys. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you uh, dear guy, do you have any comments regarding yeah, Gary's contribution? I, I, I understand where you're coming from, and I have a lot of you know, sympathy, and I hope my writings show that. I think we have a, a, a different challenge, which, um, in a sense, is to be pragmatic. We, we must not let our critics accuse us of being an extremist movement. We must not let our critics claim that we are utopian, romantic, unrealistic, uh, otherworldly, etc. Yeah, we must have those values that you've articulated very eloquently, but at the same time, we have to convey the impression that we are pragmatists and realists, and that we want to be on the road 
to a good society, not on a road away from a good society. I think that is so fundamental. It's something I've really felt over the years. We must be seen not as revolutionaries, even if many of us feel we are, but we must not be seen or depicted as that. We must be seen, yeah, we can't have what we would like ideally tomorrow or the day after, but we must be on a road. That's why I believe that to start with, we've got to think of social dividends. We've got to think of a low level basic income supplementing other benefits and gradually move in the direction of building up capital funds, what I call a commons fund that can pay out a higher and higher basic income and replace other forms of benefits and things as that grows. But it's a, it's a road. And therefore, when we're saying we would like to introduce a basic income next year, we're talking about a low amount that would help give people this security, in, increase their ability to say no, increase their ability to say yes to things they would like to do. But we know that that won't be perfect. We know that we have to move in that direction. And I, I think that what's been happening in the last 30 years is that states have been moving further and further away from a basic income society. And we have to reverse that direction. That's the first challenge. I totally agree that we shouldn't expect too much from a Biden victory. We shouldn't expect too much from social democratic parties if they win elections in Europe. We won't get too much from them. But we must energize progressives by increasing our emphasis on the values that drive us to want a basic income as an anchor of a new income distribution system. And I think that is, if we pitch our messages in that way, we will be seen as reasonable reformists. We will be seen as wanting to reduce the insecurities that are terrifying at the moment, reduce the inequalities that are terrifying. And I think that's where we pitch our, our tent. And then people say, hey, these people are reasonable. They're reasonable. Surprise, surprise. And I think then we will make more progress quickly. You got it. Uh, now, next contribution is from Professor Kailan. Uh, Professor Isa Kailan, please unmute yourself. Word yes. is yours. Thank you, Ali Mutlu. Uh, I'm very grateful uh, and thank you very much, uh, Professor Standing, for sharing your views. I'm also from Boğaziçi University. Uh, I'm an engineer, by the way, so I'm not really, I was exposed to the idea a uh, few years ago through Ali Mutlu. Uh, so I'm not a social scientist, uh, but I teach quality related courses. And surely I, uh, we talk about the quality of life and the sustainable development goals, uh, which are put uh, and with the target of year 2030, which is getting, I mean, we are getting very close. And apparently we won't be able to meet those targets fully, even though we are in good direction uh, with uh, most of the 17 goals or criteria. Uh, and I, when I was exposed to UV uh, basic income, uh, I really, I, I, I don't see it as an utopic uh, uh, concept, really. I believe in it. So I consider myself as an advocate for sure. But, uh, and we talk a lot in Turkey also. And uh, thanks to the leadership of Ali Mutlu, I, he is really investing so much time doing an incredible job. But the target platform should be, I believe, the governments, uh, the leaders. So. Uh, really, it, it would be a cure to those sustainable development goals. Uh, I'm sure, it, uh, I'm pretty sure it is discussed in United Nations, but really the leaders of the world, we should convince those guys and 
uh, it is an absolute necessity. If it is a human right, and uh, I think we see it as a human right, nobody wants anybody to die out of hunger or to stay without a shelter. In Maslow hierarchy, it is the bottom layer, really. Uh, so uh, hunger and shelter and uh, the, 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 the minimum uh, provision, uh, financial provision, uh, I think it is a modest amount and I'm sure all the countries can do it if they budget it wisely. Uh, so I wonder our current status as the world, I mean, I know advocacy is increasing, but it is a delayed project. I think we are late. Uh, I'm kind of being impatient. How soon do you think? I, I don't, I know that you don't have a crystal ball to uh, tell us, but uh, what is your opinion? Uh, how soon it will be implemented, it will be realized? A second question, uh, I occasionally look into Stanford uh, UB lab. Uh, I wonder why not similar uh, research labs are, maybe there are, but I'm not aware of in Europe, uh, uh, it should be in all the countries, really. Yeah, let me, let me respond, let me to, respond that. to that. Um, um, I'm echoing, uh, Ali, can you turn some... Uh, Professor Kailan, uh, is your question finished or contributions are finished? I guess so, yes. Uh, he's, no, he's unmuted, muted. Professor Kailan? muted now? It's muted now? He, okay. I don't have the echo now. I mean, I, I think that it, one of the things when I listen to you and listen to some of the others before you, um, made me think that one of the important things that every advocate of basic income, me included, must understand what the objections are and must have answers for those objections. I've listed 17 objections in my book on basic income, my Penguin book, which I think is being translated into Turkish. And I, I've, I've got the answers to those 17 objections. Some of you may find another objection that has to be answered. But I think it's extremely important for the movement that everybody has a standard answer. For example, you can't afford it. Yes, you can. You can build up the capacity. Yes, you can. Governments are showing at the moment they're spending billions of euros, billions of dollars, pounds or whatever in propping up the financial markets and propping up corporations and so on. They can afford an emergency basic income this year and they must. Otherwise, the costs, social and economic of the pandemic will grow. But in the longer term, they must build up a commons fund or a capital fund along the lines of Alaska, along the lines of Norway, in different ways, and I've traced how it could be done very easily, and that would be a way of paying out an equal basic income. The same with the objection about work. There is no evidence to support the claim that if you gave people basic income, they would stop working. It's not, not the case. They will be energized. They will be increasingly able to do the forms of work that many are not able to do at the moment, including care work, which we're learning is the most essential work of all, which we always should have known that. So I think, I think that part of it is very important. The other question, where it's going to come, I'm finding that there's growing support all over the world. I wouldn't be at all surprised if the first country to do it in a systemic way would be the Republic of Korea or some part of Africa where they've introduced a form of basic income in a number of places during the pandemic. Strangely, a right-wing populist in Brazil has introduced a sort of basic income and going from extremely unpopular, he's become popular by stumbling on a, on a good measure. It's sad that it's coming from that direction, but that's indicative of what we need. And the final part of your question is, the existence of research labs. I'm very privileged to be an honorary co-president of, of Bien, and they've got a new executive committee with excellent people, as Ali knows, 
involved in the leadership and they want to move to making it into an international umbrella of research and evidence from around the world, which is how we started it in 1986. But there are research labs in various places. I'm linked with a number of research labs in, in, in Great Britain, in Scotland, in Wales. They're planning a pilot in Wales at the moment, which is being driven by researchers and political activists. There are similar research labs growing in the United States and Canada and elsewhere. We, we do have a growing body of people who are steeped in research around basic income. And I think that it's vital for, for our political future that the labs should be linked together. And I very much hope that Bian, UBI and various other groups who want to do this link up together make a common cause so that everybody interested can have access to the theories and evidence that, is be, that are being generated. Uh, thank you, Guy. Uh, especially regarding news, uh, I mean, news regarding the BN. Uh, you know, we have the General Assembly on 17th of December, I guess. Mm -hmm. And we are in very close communication with Sarat and Hilda. We will hear good news, hopefully, from BN. Uh, dear guy, there are at the moment uh, three more questions from Diana Bashur uh, once again and uh, Kokmazil Koru and Ivailo Krilo. Uh, my point is, uh, considering that there may be Zoom bombing, uh, I mute all of you, but you can raise your hands uh, from the at the right you have under the participants' uh, corner. If you cannot, please let me know through chat box or some other means so that I can put into the list. So we can continue with Diana. You, Diana. Thank you, Ali. Thank you, Guy, very much. Um, my question is linked to um, my earlier question. So I'm thinking on, in, if we're thinking about uh, implementing basic income in non-Western, non-democratic, less prosperous countries, would you say that there are um, minimal macroeconomic conditions and sort of geographic conditions like natural resources or access to sea um, or you know somewhat of a balanced uh, um, uh, trade uh, um, so not an extreme trade imbalance um, would you say that there are these minimal conditions for uh, for implementing a basic income successfully so for example could it work under an embargo if a country is under embargo could that work if a country is not um, has a, its currency pegged, for example, would you implement a basic income in, in the local currency or in the different currency? Um, I know it's a bit maybe uh, too broad of a question, but any, any answer on that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. It's, it's good to hear you. Um, as you know, I've been involved in doing pilots in developing countries in Africa and in India and, and uh, been involved in other pilots in Latin America and North America. So I think it's a, a global phenomenon. And in a strange way, it would be easier to introduce a basic income system in a developing country because the complex bureaucratic welfare systems aren't there as an impediment to a new system. But I think, of course, the, the challenge of resources, financial resources, to be mobilized to pay out a basic income is a real challenge. I believe, though, that because the lower standard of living in those countries, the opportunity to mobilize through foreign aid, through uh, generous contributions from multilateral in institutions or other ways would be able to pay for a modest basic income. I think, for example, what they're doing in Malawi uh, is very, very promising. I think what they're doing in, in, in various uh, island states, which are moving in the direction, because the cost of doing it is not going to be that high. I think that the mobilization through resources 
is what's most exciting. If you've got a country that's got minerals, you can impose a levy system whereby royalties go back to the people. And those resources belong to the commons. They belong to the commoners. I'm writing a book at the moment called The Blue Commons, which is looking at all coastal states that have their 200 miles of ocean that belongs to them. And the minerals and the sea and the marine resources are fantastic. They need to control fishing. They need to stop the plunder that's taking place. But in the same way they should be mobilizing and preserving, they can also to use the sea as a source of revenue for paying out a basic income to the commoners who live, make their living or try to in, in the seashores or in the sea. I think these are different ways of mobilizing the funds. And then you come to a country like the occupied territories, the Gaza, the Palestin Palestinians, the Syria, the various parts of the uh, terribly afflicted areas of the Middle East in which you are an expert. And you say, look, the international powers have done despicable destruction to those countries. They owe compensation to the afflicted populations. It's a moral crusade and it wouldn't cost the international communities much to be providing the source for paying out basic incomes to these terrified, traumatized populations, most of whom have done nothing to deserve anything like it. But if we don't do something like a basic income in those countries, the next generation and the generation after that will be so angry, bitter, frustrated, and they'll be part of a new violent movement that none of us should want. It's an investment in peace to have a basic income in those countries. I know you're interested in Syria. I advocated 20 years ago that there should be a peace dividend in the form of a basic income paid to Iraqis who were being afflicted 15 years ago or whatever by a terrifying war that they'd done nothing to deserve. And the international community would have saved an enormous amount if they provided the resources to pay every Iraqi who survived that terror, every Afghanistani who survived the various wars that have been afflicted on them with a basic income, then we would have had the real basis for a democratic revival of those places. It seems so fundamentally sensible that you just despair of politicians that they haven't done that or something close to it. It would have saved their countries a lot of money as well as given a future and reduce the flood of refugees out of those countries, the flood of people who are starving and suffering from numerous illnesses. It seems to me that it's the most obvious justification for a basic income in those countries. And I, 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 get, I get, every day I think about it, I get a fury about the injustice and the inhumanity of all of us for allowing these things to continue and not protesting and saying, politicians, shut up or do something. And I think your question is spot on and I think you know my feelings. Thank you, Guy. Uh, next question or contribution is from Kokmas Ilkor. Dear Kokmas. You are here, I guess. I cannot see you at the moment. One second, one second. Uh... Okay, please unmute yourself. Okay, fine. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> and thank you very much for organizing this excellent 
uh, discussion on, on universal basic income and the related issues with it. And thank you very much for 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 uh, thank you very much, Guy, for being here with us. Uh, I'm I'm from Turkey. Uh, basically, I'm an economist and 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 spend my whole life as a banker and some part of it, uh, some part of it in, in development banking, some part of it in commercial banking. Now I'm a I'm a retired uh, person. Uh, well, I mean, I'm not going to deal with the importance and the significance of the universal basic income, but I should say that I am a very fervent uh, supporter of the idea because I see it as an important driver of the driver and element of the of the of the new paradigm, which would be leading to a new world order. Uh, well, I mean, it is such an important important concept that needs to be. Uh, communicated to larger masses, really. And I know that what I would be saying or I, what I would be asking or putting forward is, is something that you have already uh, tried. But as an outsider, I really do, I really do wonder if uh, there are a, a Inter on an international platform, there are coordinated efforts to tap more efficiently and more productively two platforms that seem to be necessary to read. One is politicians, whether we like them or not, they are politicians. And the second one is the academic platform. Well, I mean, a I know how difficult it is to reach out to the politicians, and and it's, I know it is very difficult to 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 to, to convince them. It's in a in a uniform manner, really. It's very difficult to mold each and every thought and each and every owner of those thoughts into the same sort of thinking. Really, I know it is very difficult, but I still do believe that there must be some more coordinated effort to reach them. I will give you two examples why I'm not so much optimistic about that. And that's why, as you are in it, really, maybe you would tell me something more encouraging. I was uh, involved very much with the work of OECD. And I have served in, in the various commissions, and I'm still uh, uh, working on, on, on uh, one commission. But I have been uh, very much involved, and I do believe that, despite uh, the fact that there are countries, there are thoughts that dominate the work of OECD to a great extent. But it is still a very shortcut uh, platform to reach out uh, for information about social, economic, and administrative policies that needs to be, uh, that needs to be implemented <coughs> really in a fair way. I know how OECD was uh, helping out to the ex-Iron uh, Curtain countries when they were liberated really. They were very eager to learn and they were, OECD was very eager to, to contribute really. Uh, despite difficulties, I mean, despite all sorts of uh, good work that is being done on social and economic matters and political matters, mostly on the administrative side, of course, I haven't seen that there is any, uh, any significant work or thought that is being developed for uh, universal basic income. I mean, not universal basic income per se, but it, there is, of course, a lot of talk about about your uh, very well named eight giants. But I didn't see <coughs> basic income as a driver, is an important engine of, of of this whole discussion. Secondly, there is this. It probably it may be wrong to compare it to, uh, to the OECD uh, with regard to the effectiveness. There's also the G20. Really. 
I mean, G20 every year. And, and in 2015, I was on the, on the Turkish team because Turkey, Turkey had the, uh, had the uh, presidency of the OECD in 2015. And, and I know in principle, I know how in principle the voice of civil society to be heard over there in an organized manner, really. Of course, the, the, the uh, civil society itself is not very much organized, but there are elements that represent the civil society, mostly on the economic side, but there are not so much a uh, voice reflecting the political issues and the, and the, and, and the totally social issues. Really. So uh, these are these my two experiences over the last two decades in these two institutions. On the one hand, gives me some hope, but on the other hand, I am disappointed, really. And but I should be short of information, and therefore maybe uh, you would give us some information about this. Uh, uh, internationally coordinated activities on your side to reach out to these two important platforms. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, has, I have to um, be careful how I answer that because I don't want to be accused of name dropping or anything like that. I, I've been working for basic income for 30 years or more and more. And I've seen and debated and discussed basic income with literally hundreds of politicians, individually and so on. And I cannot tell you how many of them have said to me in private that they support basic income or they're convinced of basic income. But they don't know how to come out in support. That's what they often say. They think that they will be attacked and it will not do their career any good. I believe that's changing and it must be changed. And I think it's up to us collectively, individually, to do something which is very important. I always think of politicians as having spaghetti backbones. What I mean by that is their backbones are not very strong and they, they don't stand up very strong. They don't like to lead. They like to think this is popular, therefore I will advocate it. And they don't have much courage. And what we have to do is strengthen their backbones. That's a way of putting it. You mentioned the OECD. I've been asked to speak at the OECD many times. And I've even written a book with the OECD. And I was having a, a private debate discussion uh, six weeks ago, something like that, with very senior members of the OECD secretariat in Paris, virtual one, obviously. And all of them were saying to me, look, we, we, we think that basic income is a very good idea, but we don't know how we can really create a debate inside the OECD because it would be seen as political. As if what they would normally do is not political, it's stupid. They were showing cowardice, in my view, but I don't expect anything different from bureaucrats, unfortunately, because they want to keep their job, they want to climb the ladder in the bureaucracy. But I am encouraged by the fact that recently I had a public discussion with the head of the UNDP, who used to be the head of UNEP, the, the Environmental Agency. And he told me, and he said it very openly so everybody could hear, that he supports it. Now, if the UNDP, which is a powerful UN agency, has come round, and we've now got a program of collaboration between Bien and a very senior group of UNDP officials, very encouraging. They also helped fund our pilot in India. The same with UNESCO. So we're seeing some changes. The head of the World Economic Forum, the Davos Group, that has endorsed my book and has told me a number of times he's a 100% supporter and he speaks up. He's, he now realizes he can speak up 
and not be accused of things. We are seeing, I was advisor to John McDonald, the shadow chancellor of the Exchequer of the Labour Party uh, for the last three years. We knew we were going to be beaten by Brexit, but to have the leading opposition party with me as an economic advisor pushing for basic income. And Jeremy Corbyn has told me personally on, on, on a virtual event as well as privately, he's come round to supporting basic income and a number of leading politicians in Britain have come out. Indeed, there was a vote in parliament where 170 members of parliament signed a, signed a, a petition demanding a basic income. If you had told me that five years ago, I would have laughed. I said I was dreaming, but it's happening. The leader of the Socialist Party stood for against Macron for the presidency. He's, he supports basic income. So we're seeing a, a gradual momentum of legitimacy. And I think that is something we have to encourage. And the pandemic is accelerating that support because we cannot get out of this unless we have something like a basic income. We will not get out of it. It will continue. It will continue because the people who in the precariat and below are not able to have the resilience, the strength, the health to recover and not be prone. You've got the vaccine, great, but there will be another set of pandemics coming down the road. We need strength for our health system, our immunity, our capacity to withstand shocks. And at the moment, we don't have that. But a basic income is something that is going to be made into an imperative. It won't be something would be nice to have. It's going to be an imperative. And I really believe that. And we must be prepared to help accelerate that. And I, I think that's where we are today. I'm not guaranteeing that it will happen. I'm not, I'm not naive, but I think we have a historical moment where if we put our energies into it, just like Ali is doing fantastically in, in, in Turkey, I, I salute you, Ali, you know that. But we have others who are also putting in their fantastic efforts and I, I just admire them tremendously. So for me, this is a good moment. It's a good moment. We should not be despairing. Thank you very much. I am very much encouraged. Thank you. Ali, Thank you. may I may oh. I ask the question? Uh, well, Maria, uh, okay, I will put you in the list. I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, we will okay. continue. Do you have time? I hope you have. Uh, dear Ivaido. Dear Ivaido Kirill from Bulgaria. Ah, oh, pardon, Ivaido, one second, one second. I have to make you co-host. Uh, we had a problem with Zoom bombers, that's why. Mm. Okay, dear Ivaido, please unmute yourself. Okay, thank you, Ali. Hello, Professor Stanley, how are you? Very well, nice to see you. Nice to see you. I will have some small questions, one by one. And the first question is, are all the UB advocates and all the people who overwrote is understanding that giving money or basic income to the people, it's not economical problem, it's psychological and mental problem. The second question is, if all these people who is advocates for the UB are aware that we need to change the political and economical system in every one country if you want to give UB to the people. The third question is, if all the people is aware that if we start to give UB to the people, that means we will be stop the corruption all over the world because everything will be legal. And there is many people who is a very big egoist, very greedy, and we don't know if they're ready to say goodbye and to separate from their greediness and from their egoism. 
And the most important things that I learned from these seven years working with the people, if somebody is not ready to receive something, you couldn't give anything to him. If the people is not ready, they will be never received unconditional basic income. This is my question and my state of the things. Uh, dear Ivailo, uh, I guess your questions are already in your hand. If you kindly share in the chat box. No, I did there all in my head. Things. I'm not writing ah. early, sorry. Everything okay. is my hand. A very interesting but question. But I can say right. again. Because this is my work and I know what I'm asking. I give okay. one example to everybody. Just the example is this. To start to give unconditional basic income in all the people in Bulgaria, we are needing 10 billion euro. Are you, can you imagine all of you that now in this moment, Bulgaria will receive uh, uh, from the European Union 26 euro on money that we don't need to give back to 26 billions that we don't need to give back to to the european union this is like uh, grants we will be have grants 26 billion and we need 10 billion to start to give people forever for the people in bulgaria can you imagine this situation for that i'm speaking that the problem is not economical the problem is mental and psychological. We need to work with the people in the level of their mental, their psychology, just they to be free themselves from the past. This is what I'm asking. And also I want to ask Guy, because he's traveling all over the world, speaking with many people, what Guy is thinking. If the people is ready to go away from their greediness, their fear and their egoism. Okay, Ali, shall I answer? Please, please, please. I mean, uh, very interesting questions and very interesting points, in fact. Thank you, Ivano. Shall I answer? Please, Kai, we, we, we are listening to you. Okay, I, I, first of all, I've, I know Bulgaria well. I've visited Bulgaria many times and worked there. I love the country. So I wish I were in Sofia with you. I, I tend to agree with your first point. It is, it is a psychological uh, issue. And this is one of the reasons why I favored pilots, uh, experiments. Not that I believe we need pilots. But pilots have a great demonstration effect and can deal with what I call low-hanging fruit objections. And one of the things that have been found in experiments by psychologists, and which I've written about, is this, that people who are insecure and lack material resources for their basic survival, they experience a diminishing level of their mental bandwidth. Their IQ, their intelligence actually drops. It's, an, it's, a, it's a physiological reality. And if you suffer from a loss of your intelligence because of being in circumstances that contributes to that, I think it's immoral for governments and experts to expect those people to be making rational long-term decisions about how they live, about their relationships, about how they develop. It would happen to all of us. If we were chronically insecure, our intelligence would drop and we would make bad decisions. But it wouldn't mean we are stupid or bad people it's the psychological conditions that matter. So for me, basic income is a matter of improving people's ability to make rational decisions. The, the, the points that you made about changing the political system, I also think is, is linked to a basic income. What we found and other people have found 
is that people who have basic security are more tolerant of others. They're more altruistic and they have greater empathy with others. The ability to put yourself in somebody else's shoes is the way one might put it. And I think that's very important for political purposes because it induces a tendency not to vote for extremists and not to vote for people who support authoritarian and divisive sort of policies. And I think that means that it would induce uh, political change. Now you mentioned money. I've been arguing that there are three basic problems facing Europe. Inequality, insecurity, and the drive of people in lower income areas to migrate in search of jobs and income from those areas to Northern Europe, which is creating more social tensions than we're talking about before COVID. Now imagine if we introduced or the European Commission, European Parliament voted for giving pilot schemes where in certain parts of Bulgaria and Slovenia or wherever, the low income countries were given a basic income for every resident, a legal resident of those communities. 200 euros a month, not much. But of course, 200 euros a month for a poor person in part of Bulgaria would be a big difference for their lives. It would have the effect of reducing geographical inequality within Europe. It would have the effect of increasing the security and therefore the health of people in those communities. And it would discourage out migration in desperation, going to countries where there are problems already. To me, this is an obvious thing to do in a pandemic. It would be an expression of social solidarity across Europe. That's what we should do. It wouldn't be a burden on the on the exchequers uh, anywhere. It would be realistic. It would show those things that I believe a basic income would show. And it would be an expression of solidarity for the European Union. All things we need. So for me, I think your approach is, is fine. I agree with it. And I hope that we can meet for a good beer or something in Sofia next year but it's it's something that more people are coming to realize and all power to you and others for saying it yeah we meet in sofia thank you so much there is two political parties invite me to speak and i think that very soon slovenia look back after me <laughs> a very nice competition thank you Ivalo. Uh, dear guy, a uh, French change his mind, and now uh, there's another question, but it's not a question, it's a series of questions, in fact. Uh, this is from Turkish speaking France. Uh, I will show you four slides, and we would like to hear your comments about these four slides. It is about a survey uh, here. Okay. Mm. This survey was uh, made uh, under the umbrella of working group number 10. I mean, the worldwide meetings of UBI advocates and UBI networks. Uh, let me go directly to the questions. Oh, maybe I should mention that there are 20 different countries. I mean, uh, between the people who fill in the survey, uh, they are from these uh, 20 different countries. Uh, this is important, I guess. The first question is, uh, I mean, I will, I will show you the four slides. Should I do it one by one or four together? As long as we have enough time to digest it, it's okay. Okay, so four together then. Uh, the question is, do you think that politicians and political parties have an adequate understanding of UBI? The answers are 49.5% no and 6.8% yes. I mean, please just consider the blue and the red zones. It shows that about... 83%, I mean, redistributed version of this survey is uh, saying that uh, 
they do not have adequate understanding of UBI. But this is not a big problem. The bigger ones are coming. The second one is, do you think that politicians and political parties are in favor of a UBI, which will lead to emancipation? Again, uh, the red zone is 32% and um, blue zone is 6%. So 32 plus 6, 38%. If you redistribute it, again, more than 80% of the people think that uh, they, they will not be happy with UBI, which will emancipate people. I mean, it says that they want them to be with troubles. Uh, so they don't want their emancipation. Fifth one is, um, I think, the most uh, interesting one. It is about, uh, um, again, the, the question is, do you think that politicians and political parties are trying to denigrate the concept of UBI? Denigrate, I mean, modify it or uh, degenerate, degenerate it or consider some other uh, social policies as uh, UBI. And here again, 32% says, yes, they are doing this, unfortunately. And 13.6% says no. So again, if you consider the blue and the red zones only, I mean, make a redistribution, it's a huge percentage. So when we start from three, uh, whether they have adequate understanding or not, again, more than 80% says no whether they are in favor of uh, UBI or not, because it will lead to emancipation. Again, huge person says no. And uh, whether there is a degeneration, denigration of the concept, again, huge person says uh, yes. And the last slide is about uh, the integrities or uh, uh, as the integ are the integrities of the characteristics that define a UBI being threatened. Uh, will, uh, this question, is an interesting one because uh, we give uh, the chance to mention uh, which characteristics is under threat. And uh, interesting, uh, 47 or 46.5 percent of the people. Uh, this is an opinion survey at the end of today, the but they say that unconditional, uh, the un unconditionality characteristics, uh, char characteristic of the UBI is under threat. And the others are um, universal, uh, 44 percent. Sufficient 36%, permanent 31%, individual 22%. And uh, maybe I forgot to mention this the name of the survey is Effects of the COVID 19 Pandemic on the UBI Movement, Opinions of UBI Advocates. So these are um, the results obtained after the pandemic. So it, it, it contains the pandemic touch in it. So the question is uh, my friends would like to know your uh, comments or your feelings about these uh, four slides. Thank you. You're asking me, Ali? Yeah, dear guy, my friends would like to hear your uh, feelings or comments about these slides, then I will translate them later after the meeting. Because we yeah, are, I... the slides were in English, uh, but we are using uh, again in Turkey too during our discussions. But they would like to hear your words about okay. these results. When the the wording of the last one, Ali, is is a bit confusing. I don't know when you when you say under threat. Do you mean that uh, those are the the characteristics that politicians most dislike, or what do you mean by under threat? I mean, they feel they feel the, fear those don't like those. What do you mean when you say that unconditional is under threat? What does that mean, uh, dear guy? The, con uh, the question uh, we work together with Annie uh, Reinhardt and uh, Julio and uh, Sheila all together. Questions are prepared yeah. all together. Here, when we say under threat, what we meant is, uh, you see, uh, let's say. By definition, we have the definition of UBI. We have it. Yeah, but yeah. If you, for example, in Spain or in Italy, you know the coalition in Italy, or the minister in Spain, they mentioned that they they, they use the words basic income, but what they did is was not uh, basic income. So it was a modified version. So they are using the terminology, but not fulfilling the uh, all expectations of basic income. So mm, they are trying to take it uh, aside. I mean, 
without this component or without that component. I mean, when we say under trade, it means um, modified but reduced or uh, de degenerated version. But from that point of view, from let's say universality or may I may I reopen the uh, slide? Yeah, yeah. So, for example, permanent. Many people think that. I mean, the opinion surveys uh, results shows that 31% of the people think that uh, the discussions on the table at uh, the governmental level, especially. Uh, they do not want it uh, as a permanent uh, UBI, a kind of temporary something, but they call it still UBI or emergency basic income or some other terminologies they adapt. But this shows that it's not for lifetime and uh, it's for maybe for once or for certain months. So this uh, component is under threat. Uh, or am I clear enough? I mean, uh, maybe no, I, well, I, I think, Ali, I think what you mean or they mean. Yeah. is that sorry i think what they mean is the reason for opposition i mean is this a reason for opposition that it's universal or that it's unconditional i mean if looking at the ordering of those answers um the unconditional the fact that a basic income is unconditional might be a reason why a lot of politicians don't like it okay they they don't like a scheme that is unconditional that that I will understand. Universal. They wouldn't they wouldn't want it to be universal. They like means testing and targeting and so on. So if you said, um, what do you what do you think the politicians uh, think that makes them oppose basic income? Then I can understand that that graph. Um, so you know, being threatened. I'm not quite sure what that means, honestly being threatened i mean being opposed are the integrities of the characteristics in english i'm not sure what that what that means maybe maybe we can say which they would like to eliminate i mean without so we know which uh, which are the reason i mean if you show that table again which are the characteristics of a basic income that they most oppose or that they oppose okay. yeah they are not happy with they are not happy with yeah, which are the characteristics of the basic income they don't like, they don't like, right? And then I can see why. The politicians are very moralistic often, so they would be opposed to unconditionality. They would be opposed to universality because they support only supporting the poor or something like that. And then I then you can see the order. I would use non-withdrawable rather than permanent. In, in that that uh, graph, um, but um, I'm not really particularly worried about those figures because you don't know from that sort of figure what is the intensity of their feelings. Okay, could they be could they be converted? I've spoken with various politicians, and to start with, uh, I. I I spoke, had a debate with the leader of the Liberal Democrats, and 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 to start with, he was very hostile to basic income because he thought what we meant was that it's going to replace all other incomes, and therefore there would be no incentive for people to take a job. Okay, so when I told him no, it's going to be a modest basic amount, and that you you're going to get it unconditionally in behavioral terms and unconditional and in what income other earned income you're getting then he said oh okay now i understand it um yes in that case i'll, I'll come around i think i'll support it but 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 many of them if they don't know what it means don't expect them to have good understanding of the different characteristics <laughs> that's what i would feel I mean, you see that most of them say they don't, they know, don't have a good understanding, or people think that. Okay. Uh, thank you, Guy. Is there any other questions, dear friends? Uh, as far as I see, nobody's raising. Who's put this here. list of who's put this list of uh, uh, things about basic income up here on the chat? I did. 
I did. I believe. Yeah, well, I mean, the questions, uh, the the benefits of it. Yeah. Because uh, that I wanted to uh, explain how disturbing this is, because this is uh, actually uh, I don't know European platform. Uh, <laughs> who is for basic income. And uh, when they are asking for the signatures, I believe the questions are misleading. And that's why I think we have a problem because you see, I'm a really a UBI, uh, UBI activist and I can, I can say, well, I, I see only one point of UBI here. Everything else is manipulation and misleading. And I see the problem of UBI activists is exactly that, that, that because they are promising too much. You know, Guy, uh, you and I, we, we, we are on the same term when we are going, let's start modest UBI. Right. And let's start with what we already have. And UBI is actually guarantee, guarantee not going below, not getting another, uh, another hundred euros, but all the others I can hear in Slovenia, they are talking. Yes, you will get additional money. It's not true. It's not true that everyone will get additional money. It's a matter of. I think that one of the, if I may interrupt, yeah. I think one of the things that we have to say regularly, those of us who advocate a basic income is that everybody who's a resident, a usual legal resident of the country should be entitled to the basic income. And that you would claw it back in taxes on the rich people who get it. It's much more efficient and equitable to do it that way round so that the, the rich would receive their basic income as an economic right but they would pay a higher tax rate, which would mean that they would not gain or lose as a result of the of that basic income. There may be a good reason for taxing them a higher rate. I'm much I'm I'm in favor of that, but that's not the argument to make when making the argument for basic income. I do think that that you we are entitled to say that everybody who has a, a low average income would actually be, be beneficiary. They would get more than they would do at the moment, but maybe not much more. And I think that's, it's to be realistic and say, look, we're going to move in this direction and gradually increase along with the resources to do it and the parliamentary support for it and so on. I think that that's, that's the way to go rather than suddenly to say, from tomorrow morning, you're all going to get extra 500 euro or whatever it might be. I, I think that's that's not a realistic, uh, strategic way of doing it. But that's what we want. That's what we want. We want that every individual in Turkey or everywhere, anywhere else, has been talking about Bulgaria, we would get, and Slovenia obviously would be giving given basic income security and that they would then be able to earn extra of course and that as the resources could be mobilized you would gradually raise the basic income towards a higher level so that you could meet your basic needs your housing costs your rents your your food costs the costs of looking after your relatives and so on so you gradually change the system and that, I think, is the way to see it um, and the way to present it. This is where we should be going. Say it like that. Uh, dear Kai, thank you very much. Uh, Ali, that Maria. was not my question. Uh, I wanted to say uh, like 10 questions ago when Guy Standing was talking with the professor about how optimistic we can be and who can help us. Uh, I wrote down uh, the happy news that in Slovenia in this year, we got three different kinds of UBI schemes. 
uh, none of them the real one, but the best one is the last one. It's for church workers, church employers who don't play, pay taxes and it should be permanent. It should be on minimum wage and uh, uh, all the UBI uh, community is really uh, angry with our right wing government and only I'm happy because it's a, it's a good start and it's for the first time that we see in Slovenia that someone gets money only to be alive uh, and I would like to say that it's really I don't like pilots, I don't like labs, but I'm happy that we started with a partial UBI schemes because we can learn a lot. We do, I mean, our government does all the different kinds of mistakes, but they're really valuable. And I, I want to say that academia doesn't help, the, the public administration doesn't help, Politicians are for UBI and they don't get support. They don't get laws. They don't get a um, system made for making UBI. I don't know, Guy, if you understand me, but we lack, we lack uh, support of uh, administrators how to do it. The will is there. Politicians are for it. They don't get the right, I don't know how to, how to put it. Policy makers, policy makers are the problem. Thank you. Well, just, uh, respond, yeah. just let me respond to that by saying that um, one of your members of the European Parliament uh, has contacted us recently and we're hoping to have an event of some sort uh, in Zagreb uh, so that, that there will be a chance to extend the debate there, I hope. It's not mine, it's uh, Croatia. Uh, you're correct, friends, you're uh, correct, you're correct. Dear friend, it's now maybe longer than one and a half hour. Uh, I would like to thank uh, your guy. Thank you very much for this very informative uh, event. I mean, thank you for your uh, time and uh, your efforts. Uh, one thing I would like to say is that uh, I put into the chat box the full presentation. Uh, if you like, you can download it, but you cannot mm, download it by saving the chat. You have to click on the files and you have to download to your computers. Or if you like, you can put your email addresses and I can send it to send them to you. Uh, Guy, last thing I would like to say is, uh, what, what was it? Okay, it's not a big issue, but let, let me let me say it very quickly. Let me say it very quickly. Uh, where is it? Okay, here, here. One last thing in a second. Yes, it is here. Uh, dear guy, uh, last year we had the chance to have our uh, national congress in Istanbul, Turkey. I mean, it was not in Istanbul; it was a Zoom-based event. It was a one full day event, uh, nine uh, different sessions. And it was very, very interesting. Uh, many, many uh, people uh, attended and participated to these events. And this year we will have the second uh, Congress in Istanbul, on, I mean, at Zoom again on 15th of May. Uh, I will send you an invitation. Uh, if you kind of accept, maybe we can hear you during that event too, 15th of May, 2021. Hope we can make it. Thank you very much. Uh, I am unmuting you all. And... Okay. Uh... Guy, are you there still? Yes, I'm here. Okay. No, I know that you have another meeting. That's why. Uh... Yeah, I do. I, mean, I should be going. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Ali Bey. Selma Hanım'ın bir sorusu vardı. Belki e, Gay Bey onu uh, chat box'ta bir bakabilir misiniz lütfen? Teşekkür ederim. One last question at chat box. Where is it? Uh, uh, Selma Hanım direkt sorsun. Okay, Selma Hanım. Uh, Gay, do you have one more minute for and last question? Uh, 
Okay, last question. <laughs> okay, uh, Sam Adam. Please unmute yourself. Hello. Sam Adam. Okay, let me read the question, guy. The question is, would the basic income be accepted by the politicians when they are able to get more legally information data about the daily life of the population? Uh, I mean... I, I think one has to think of different types of politicians. They're not all the same. I, I, think, I think our prospects of getting support from those politicians who are concerned about the ecology, the environment, I think we will get their support increasingly. I think people on the left who realize the old social democracy doesn't work in the 21st century, they will have to change. Otherwise their history, they're going to disappear. I think it's much harder to convert people on the political right and I feel that they're going to be continuing to oppose us. But I feel that we have a chance now because the old politics are breaking down. They're, they are seen by many people as irrelevant. So we're looking for a new politics. And that, I think, is an opportunity. But do you think, if you allow me just to uh, complete my question, uh, do you think that giving more data to the politicians from the population would be a kind of a deal uh, to bring this uh, unconditional income um, more fastly to the population? Yeah, obviously, I, I, I do agree with you that, that uh, statistics and information should count. It should count. I think it will do it in two ways. One, it will tend to convert some people who just want to be converted because they, they have open minds. Mm -hmm. And it will also convert some because they will say, ah, this is a popular policy. So I want to be popular. I want to be elected. So I will support it. So you'll have two. You'll have the people who approach politics from a moral point of view, and you'll have people who will approach it from a more opportunistic point of view. But I agree with you that evidence call, help, should help. help. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, maybe giving more data from us could uh, lead to a better control of the population, which would, which would uh, give the politicians more arguments to say, we can say okay to the unconditional income um, or to the basic income because we have more data of the population, so it is a good exchange. Yeah, I mean, that, that should help. And I'm not saying that it will convert everybody. Some people are dogmatic, prejudiced. They don't want to see mm -hmm. people have security and so on. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think we should be worried about them, but there are people, a lot of people in the middle. And they also motivate some people who are not in politics today, but they would like to go into politics. And that, I think, is what we should be encouraging. We want to encourage the idealistic young, the people who care about the future of the planet, that care about society, that don't like what their parents have done. Come out, fight for it, or at least struggle for it. And I think that evidence, and that's why I favor pilots, even though... I know we don't need them to have a new system, but pilots convert people. They make people think. They make people realize that it does reduce stress. It does reduce mental illness. It does have these positive effects. And evidence counts in the end. It does count. Thank you very much, Guy. Uh, I know you are... Yes, uh, yes, you are quite late, I guess. I'm sorry, uh, uh, but there are too many questions. It was a great opportunity. Uh, Thank you very much. No, it's to our everybody. Pleasure. My pleasure. Great. Okay. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, dear friends who are going to join tomorrow's worldwide meeting, uh, you are all welcome. I I'll try a little. Ivalo, please do, please come. Yeah, yeah. I try tomorrow. Uh, because we are going to try what we can do beyond the comfort zone. I mean, yeah. just, it will be a brainstorming session, but it might be interesting. Yeah, we need to speak many things. Yeah, yeah, yeah.
Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, dear friends. Çok teşekkürler değerli arkadaşlar. Uh, hope to see you in another event. Uh, I am closing the session. Good evening. Good afternoon. Good morning. Wherever you are.